Hey, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the first edition of Friday Night Behind the Lens in 2021. I'm joined here tonight by uh, Mr. Jim Fisher of Vintage Illumination Photography. Welcome, Hi Jim. Hey, How are thanks you? Thanks for having me on, Paul. I'm, huh? I'm doing great. Today's thanks. a good day. Thanks for being on. And we're still it. we're both still celebrating Christmas, so. Absolutely. I've got, um, we, we do Christmas big in our house. You know, we live in a Victorian built in 1872. And so we've, um, th that's what they're made for is to doll up. So we still have the, the stockings up hung by the chimney with care. And I got a fire going in the fireplace and, and, uh, we, well, we, I don't have, we I don't really have a fireplace going house. here. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do have the tree and my stockings mm -hmm. are out of view. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Merry Christmas to you and happy new year. Thanks. Same to you. <laughs> So uh, let's get started. Let's not waste any time. Let's let everybody see what you're all about. All right. Sure. For those out there that don't follow you, just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and you know a little bit about your background. Yeah. Well, that's what I always tell people. They ask me, where are you from? And I always say I'm from Michigan. And um, I've lived kind of all over the state. Um, but we moved a lot when I was a kid. My dad was a operations manager for factories, which is kind of a like a small corporate hatchet man. So kind of like Winston Churchill, right? He was the right man for the time, but after World War II, nobody wants that kind of personality around anymore. So they got rid of him. And so we moved a lot anyway, um, but I'm very fortunate. I have three cities in Michigan that I call my hometown. One is Holland, Michigan, which is on the west side of the state. With and all those windmills, I, right? Yeah, with the windmills and tulips, tulip time. Tulips, yeah. And, um, Yep, that's where I spent kind of my boyhood years all the way up through like sixth grade, those really formative years where you you live in your imagination and build tree forts and that fun time. Now, Holland there has... there we moved um, at one... Go ahead. Holland has the big red uh, lighthouse? Yes, the big red lighthouse. Yes. Yeah. Yep, and I did uh, the big red lighthouse in, uh, I think it was my second blog that I did um, yes. when I was still experimental and trying to figure things out and what all was going on. So, but, uh, but yeah, so then we moved from Holland to one little short stop, but then settled out in Coldwater, Michigan, okay. which is right in the dead center of the state, right on where Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio meet. Um, and that's actually where I went to junior high and high school and then ended up opening up a uh, photography studio in downtown Coldwater and had that for 10 years. Uh, portrait studio, we did weddings and high school senior portraits and children and families. All the normal stuff that a portrait studio does. Sure. And um, then I was there for, you know, like I said, I had the studio for 10 years and, um, you know, life changes and different things happen in life. And I ended up selling the studio and uh, moving and um, um, ended up living in Port Huron, which is where my wife is from. In fact, we <laughs> actually met just before I, um, that's what moved me to Port Huron is that we met and, um, um, she was living in Port Huron. I decided I couldn't live without her. So I moved over to Port Huron, which is then my my third and longest hometown of any place I live. And right on the Canadian border. Right. Yeah. Port Huron is an international city. So we uh, are right across from Point Edward and Sarnia, Ontario. Sarnia. And we have the twin, twin span of um, bridges um, that uh, go from the U.S. to Canada, and we're the third largest uh, commercial crossing um, of traffic between the U.S. and Canada. And that bridge features a lot, quite often in your your videos. Yeah, yeah, it's you, you kind of work with with what you got, right? So absolutely, you know, I live in the I live in the Blue Water area. We have this beautiful blue water where Lake Huron turns into the Saint Clair River. We have the bridge. Um, we've got a lighthouse, so I kind of work with those areas. The guys like Gavin Hardcastle, who live in British Columbia, get to work with what they have in British Columbia. Um, I don't have that kind of scenery here. So you you work with what you got. You play the hand you're dealt. Absolutely. You had your photography studio, but uh, when yes. did you first become a photographer? When did you first have oh. an interest in it? Early? Yeah, it was actually quite early. Um, this is um, in the cold water era of my life. And um, in fact, uh, I, I don't know what sparked it. I have a vague memory of reading a, a book, one of those 1950s um, um, like teen novels that they would sell in schools. I came across one in the library called Shutterbug. Sure. And uh, I remember reading that and then um, just became interested. I knew we had a bunch of negatives laying around. So I actually built a photo enlarger out of a Pringles can and a magnifying glass and then constructed a, <laughs> it's pretty funny, cool. and uh, constructed a little makeshift darkroom in the bathroom of our house and just started printing the pictures that were negatives that we had laying around. 
um, that I had found. And then from that, um, you know, I just started doing things. And then uh, my, that's my, remember my dad asked me, would you, would you like to get a camera? And I said, sure. And um, we came across this ad with that Calamar 660 that I've shown. Yep. Um, and uh, so that was actually the very first camera. My dad bought that for me. The, you the still have that, lenses. is that correct? I still have it. They, that exact camera. Yes. And it, it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, <laughs> and in fact, um, it stopped working when uh, shortly after we got it and I took it to a camera repairman and he actually disassembled part of it and removed some of the mechanisms. So there's some things it won't do that it was designed to do. Um, and he said, are you ever going to use a flash with this? And I said, never. So all the stuff that would fire a strobe unit are, is gone um, off the camera. But because um, uh, it helped help it fire because it was, it was dragging. And then when I dug it out again recently, um, it wouldn't fire. So I actually went through and uh, I, I've got a needle oiler that I got because I, I'll dabble and use camera equipment here and there. Um, and uh, I got one specifically to oil a uh, Canon AE1 that I had picked up at an estate sale. Um, you were familiar with Canons. You had your one vlog. I had my uh, one with that Canon. failed vlog, yep. but yep. All right. Yep. With the, with the <laughs> Canon camera. And, uh, but they develop what's known as a sneeze and there, you have to oil some really specific parts in there. And that's what I wondered if, gosh, I could use this oiler. Maybe if I oil these parts in this camera and sure enough, the Calamar is working again. And uh, so I've got some black and white film and we're going to feature that in an upcoming vlog. Yeah. I can't wait for that. Yeah, I, I, I miss my Hasselblad a lot. Um, that was absolutely my favorite camera um, because it, it was robust. It was light. It worked. It was sharp as a tack. Um, just beautiful, beautiful images would come out of that. Um, and I didn't tear it up like the other cameras. Right. I went through a lot of camera systems so before I ended up settling on the Hasselblad. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your uh, photography studio? Sure, sure. Um, absolutely. I opened the, my studio um, at first in 1980. Um, so right during, right at the beginning of the 80s, obviously. And I had it in a little basement location for a year. And then a location opened up, which ironically was directly across the street from this little basement where I started. And it was a building that had been built as a photography studio in 1906 and was still owned by the same family. And the photographer that had been running there had moved out. And so it was available. So I uh, moved all my stuff over there and uh, started that going. Uh, we did uh, high school seniors, um, weddings, family portraits, um, children, um, different things along that line. And uh, the 1980s and 90s, too, were kind of in the Midwest, anyway, the real golden era for high school seniors. So I was photographing over 300 high school seniors a year um, and running through. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you, so you, what, were uh, you the only yeah. photographer or did you hire no, another? No. And in fact, Coldwater is a town of 9,000 people. It's a little rural town. Uh, we had, um, I think, three traffic lights, if I remember right, in town. And that was it. And there were three studios um, in that little town. Wow. And so it was, it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, one studio was primarily wedding based that also did high school seniors. And uh, there was myself who was really a high school senior studio that also did weddings. And then um, ironically, one of the, the two photographers that had been in the building where I was that had split up and moved out. One of them moved back to town and opened up um, a studio. Um, in town. So he was, he became one of my main competitors. So I reached out a lot. We did a lot of direct mail. Um, so back in that era and you know, you'd buy mailing lists and yep. print off labels and print little postcards and mail them out and have deals and mail flyers and all kinds of things. We had quite an extensive mailing list that we do every year. And it was a big thing. In fact, I bought a computer back in the era of green screens and dot matrix printers um, you know, long before windows existed and, you know, was just doing everything right there. How, uh, how long did you have the studio for before you sold it for, for 10 years, for 10, 10 years. years. And okay. I got, I got pretty, I got burnt out. Um, it became kind of the same old, same old, sure. um, we were doing video production work as well. Um, you know, I would video weddings and, uh, so we would do that. And then, so I'd shoot those on VHS and then I'd actually bump it to three quarter. What's VHS? Sony. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> it's the it's the inferior format that won over Betamax. Yes. <laughs> um, that yeah, it was actually a better video format. Um, I was really disgruntled about that. But uh, but yeah, so I bump it to, to three quarter inch Sony Umatic, and um, um, so I do that. In fact, my Sony video decks, um, each one weighed uh, about two hundred pounds, and I had two of them. They were enormous, absolutely enormous. The equipment that used to be. Wow. And um, so I had that and time-based correctors and all kinds of things. So I do all the editing at three quarter and then bump it back down to half inch um, video format and uh, do that. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. It was a That's lot of work. a uh, lot more than digital, I guess, right? Yeah, it's, I, I am dumbfounded. I got this iPhone I can carry in my pocket and I'm doing broadcast quality TV, you know, from this thing I can slip in my pocket and I don't have to have a huge pack over my shoulder and a separate video cam and cords and and um it's it's crazy absolutely crazy well that's kind of a good segue into my next question so since you've done film and all the older photography and and now mm -hmm. the digital which do you prefer digital hands down hands down not as, even a, not a even a hesitation there not not even a hesitation on that i am having a ball watching the uh, can i call them hipsters I'm not sure, learning film photography. Yeah. And they've been doing digital and all of a sudden they're discovering the, the RB67s or the Pentax 6x7 cameras and they've never shot with them. They're taking them out and trying to figure all this stuff out. And they don't realize, you know, the difference between how film sees light and how a digital sensor sees light. Right. Um, and also just, it, just some of the mechanics. But for instance, all right, I would shoot a high school senior and high school seniors don't necessarily have the best complexions um, around. So we would use, or I would put a uh, soft R number two filter on um, to kind of smooth things out a little bit, send off, have to send the film to the color lab right. and it'd be printed. And in about two weeks, I'd get a set of proofs back. And uh, actually we shot Hasselblad, so which is a square format. So then we would manually cut all those photographs from a five by five square proof to a four by five square proof. So we could crop them ourselves. And, um, you know, I didn't trust the lab to do any cropping. So we would do it that way, put them all in a folio. They would pick them out and decide what they want. Then they'd order their prints. From what they ordered, I would pack everything up and then we'd, I'd send the negatives to my retoucher, which was in Muskegon, Michigan. Okay. And so I'd mail them to her. She would do all the negative retouching. And then she would then, because I made sure she had the, the mailers, she would then mail them to my color lab, which was in Indiana, that would do all the processing. And then they would send all the prints back. So retouched and everything. And that was um, anywhere from a two to six week turn um, from that point. So because it would, well, I guess the minimum would be four weeks, really not two weeks because with, with the retouching and everything involved. So four to six weeks later, they'd have prints. So it was you know, two to three months after we did the shots before anybody actually had the photographs. So I see why you answered without hesitation, digital. I had a, uh, cause the Hasselblads had interchangeable backs you could put on them. So I had a Polaroid back, you could snap on, I take the film off, snap the Polaroid back on and then do a shot and then you pull it and you have to wait your time and then peel apart the Polaroid. And then you could see, is my lighting right? How does this work? But you couldn't see any individual expressions. You just had to right. trust yourself as you went. So yeah, I got to where I, I would focus and compose and then stand back and then not look through the cameras. I was doing the photographs. I had a remote trip for the camera and uh, cause I would watch and then, you know, watch to see if the person was a blinker or not. And then you just have to, to work with them. Cause some people uh, blink during the photographs. You can't have that. You're only doing six, 12 or 24 <laughs> shots of the right. person. And that's it. That's it. Let's jump ahead about 40 yeah. years. <laughs> When and why did you decide to start your own YouTube channel? The YouTube channel? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, actually, that was that, that kind of was a morphing process. Um, you know, during the whole initial COVID shutdown, right? What do we do? So I was working and uh, then you know, work had shut down. So you just sit at home, right? And it's like a two week vacation, you figure. But then it stretches into three, four, five, six weeks, two months. And, um, you know, we had the extra unemployment money coming. So. Yep what the heck I could do what I want to do. And so I thought, well, I got this equipment anyway. So as I had the Fujifilm system um, that I bought for, to, uh, for a trip to Europe that we did, because I wanted some good photographs. 
And I thought, well, I could do some stock photography work. So I started doing that, get myself all set up and got myself registered with a few of the agencies and started sending things in. Well, that was right when all the pricing got cut. So, I mean, most stock images were going for 26 cents as it was, but they cut it all the way down to 11 cents. And it's like, I'm not doing that. You know, so I actually deleted all my photographs off the stock sites. And um, I think I lost, I think I had sold three or four. So I think I lost maybe, maybe 50 cents. So I didn't ask him for that uh, money, but uh, um, so it's like, well, that didn't work. So now what? <laughs> and uh, so then there are some high, high profile niche stock agencies that I'm still working on getting set up with. But then I was watching these people do YouTube videos and I thought I could do that. So I did the one, the first one where I went out to the, the lake and photographed the sunrise and there was that boat hoist. Yep. And that was just, just to see, can, you know, can I do this? You know, can do, can I have the patter? Can I set things up? Can I do it live? And uh, so that was a pure test, absolutely unscripted. And um, I just went out and did it and uh, showed it to a couple of friends of mine. And they said, I'd watch that. Yeah. So I thought, what the heck? Let's and go you do, for it. And you do do it and you do do it very well. Well, thanks. What big plan, um, what big plans do you have coming up for your channel? Well, you know, I kind of spilled the beans a little bit in the one video I did about some upcoming stuff. I'm going to do some film uh, work, uh, photography, and uh, kind of dabble into that because I'm I'm actually still really comfortable with that. Um, and then kind of made the decision that I'm going to do everything in black and white because then I can process it myself and I can just scan the negatives and and uh, we can do I, I can do all the digital work and retouch and enhancement after that. Um, but it'll be more of a kind of an expiration of that. Um, yeah, I think cool. I need to go, you know, I really have been thinking about some of these people that are, you know, like in the Lake District in England or in British Columbia or in Australia, and they have this epic scenery all around them all the time. And so they're able to do these wonderful little vlogs where they go. Well, I just got a couple little parks and wooded areas. So I'm thinking I need to play in a little more to my strength. And that would be some portrait work. So I'm actually in the process of setting up a uh, studio with strobe lights um, and acquiring the equipment and kind of teach um, the different lighting. So I can, you know, show people how to pose from the ground up and um, some lighting techniques. You know, what's the diff- what is short lighting? What is modified loop shadow? And how is that different than Rembrandt lighting and broad lighting and butterfly lighting? And why do we do what? And when do we want, you know, a diffuse light like a softbox? Or when do we want a sharp light like a parabolic and why? Um, you know, those are things that we really had to learn um, in the film era. But with computers and digital retouch, you can replicate a lot of that. So, um, but I still think some of that base knowledge, um, kind of like my son, when he bought his first car, I said, you should get a manual transmission, um, so he could learn how to shift. And it's cause it's a skill you learn and never sure. forget like riding a bicycle. Yep. So, and I think it builds, it builds a foundation. So even when he drives, you know, a vehicle that's automatic transmission, he, he understands what's actually going on. You can feel the shifting. You can Ab- feel the gears. Absolutely. So. Well, one of my favorite videos of yours is uh, was the portrait outdoor portraiture uh, one with uh, your wife. Oh yes, I had a yeah. great model. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I'm, personally, I'd like to see a little bit more of that uh, that kind of portraiture uh, vlog from you mixed in there. I think that'd be fantastic. Well, thanks, thanks. Yeah, that's uh, part of it. As long as as long as we're going to have all the distancing, you know, she's she's going to be my model. And uh, we'll do we'll do some of that. In fact, I'll get her out and do some with the lens baby. I think with her, um, you know, maybe in our downtown in the evening or uh, something. I don't quite have that formed up yet. So, last question for you, okay? So, yeah. if, if there's somebody watching right now who doesn't currently follow you, what can you say to them that's going to make them hit that subscribe button? What what do you feel is your strengths of your channel? Well, actually, I I think the biggest strength of my channel is the reason I named it what I did, and that's vintage illumination. I think I have some knowledge of a past era and that I can pass on. Um, So the vintage knowledge and I can provide some education or illumination um, as far as what might be able to help people do things. Um, Plus, you know, I try to I try to make it entertaining. I try to make my videos um, moderately fast paced. Um, you know, basically kind of a serious, we're, we're doing something, we're trying things, but never afraid to admit when things go wrong or when I fail. Um, 
but um, just kind of a, a journey. I think, I think we're there having a good time and uh, I know I'm having a good time and I just want people to come along with me and kind of experience this journey. I think one of the favorite things about your vlogs for me, I learn something new every time. Mm -hmm. You're not afraid to like get in there and get like, you know, several vlogs. You're down on the ground, upside down, you know, trying yeah. to get that shot. Yeah, it, but I don't, just, I don't have a, I don't have a flippy screen on my camera. <laughs> I have to do it that No, no, no. <laughs> I, I like to see us old guys down on the ground, get, you know, getting yeah. into it. You know, and you just have a very nice way of presenting. You know, you have a nice, almost a radio kind of voice. And it comes across good on video. So, yeah, uh, I love your videos. Well, thanks. I appreciate that very much, Paul. So, well, I, I like wanna... yours too. And for real, sincere, sincere. That's why, you know, I reached out to you the one time. Well, yeah, you, you, you whooped my butt in that lighthouse challenge. I know there's no, no winners, no losers in that. I, it was, well, you know, you just uh, show up on a day and it's, it's, a, it's, you know, what God gives us as far as weather. Yeah. You got it. You got a great sunrise. That what was that your third or fourth time out, right? Yeah, I think it was the fourth. Yeah, we went out four days. I'm going to yeah. link that one up here for everybody to see because mm -hmm. that sunrise was spectacular that you got. Yeah. All right, Jim. Well, thank you for coming on tonight. Really appreciate it. I think this is a great first episode of uh, 2021. And great, Paul. I really I appreciate you asking me. It's been great. Well, I've been meaning to get to you. I've been hopping all over the world between the UK and Australia. I didn't want to show any favoritism to the USA guys. Ah, I understand that. Yeah, thanks again, Jim. And uh, uh, Tuesdays, Tuesday blogs, right? Usually, yeah, but you know they're there forever. So I've been uh, you know holiday season, and I haven't been posting as much on a regular basis. Um, so, but yeah, yeah, theoretically, it'll always be on Tuesdays. Perfect. All right, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jim. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate All right. it. We'll see you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.